Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live recording of Dragon Talk. How's it going? I'm Greg Tito, and I'm here with Matt Cernet right now. Howdy. We are going to get into some fun Laurie Cheneau recordings segments is, 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 uh, very soon. Uh, but I wanted to say hi to you guys first. How awesome is Danny Hartel, the uh, uh, costumer, designer extraordinaire behind Craft Hags? Uh, very excited that she's back on the channel with her two hour craft tag show uh that was awesome to watch hope you guys had fun watching it too she's making something super special um and uh, uh i can't wait to see more and more as it comes on in the uh, in the weeks to come so yeah you can start your monday twitch D D viewing at 12 noons on mondays uh and then we'll go right into us doing some uh, you know uh, dragon talky type things and then uh, we got a full slate coming out to Tuesdays starting tomorrow at 12 noon I'm sorry no it's actually starting at 1 p.m. Mr. Mike Merles is starting up a weekly show or is it a bi-weekly show I think it's a weekly show um, it is called uh, happy fun time with Mike Merles and uh, he will be starting off designing the subclasses that were uh, given out as part of the extra life um, promotion uh, for us last year uh, in raising money for Seattle Children's Hospital. But a high price tag on those. I think he, uh, he required $2,500 each for each of his custom design subclasses from one of you guys out there. They sold out within hours, wow. which is crazy. Uh, everybody wants those those hot Mike Merle subclasses designed for them. Uh, so he's going to be making those uh, in his uh, first couple episodes of uh, Super Happy Fun Time with Mike Merle's. Uh, starting at 1 p.m. tomorrow. So tune in for that. Uh, and then Mr. Bart Carroll will be doing his Dragon Plus. And we'll be doing another uh, Doodles. D and Doodles? Doodles and D? No. Dungeons and Doodles. Dungeons and Doodles. Maybe we need to add these to the uh, to the list here. Uh, Dungeons and Doodles, uh, in which uh, he will be, um, uh, you know, moderating in real time as as uh, some of the cartoonists here in the office are uh, doodling. Uh, it's, it's super fun. We did one of those last month, last year, really, uh, but last December, and uh, people loved it, so we're doing it again. Then I'll be on with uh, D&D News at 3.30, followed by another episode of Dice Camera Action uh, at 4 p.m. with Chris. So good stuff happening there. Uh, Wednesday, Misclicks is off, uh, but there and uh, Mazer kind of Fury's fate will have their postseason Q and A with the whole cast. So get your questions ready uh, for Rudy Rutenberg. I think Ask Rudy is the hashtag they're using for that. Um, and uh, or you can just tune in and ask them questions in chat. Great way to kind of get all of, of the information about what has happened over the course of the entire season out into the uh, things. I love these kind of Q and A sessions too because I don't know. They I like just being able to have a debrief and talk about your uh, your D&D sessions. It's pretty fun. Um, and then on Thursday, Codename Entertainment, Idol Champions, will be doing their thing at 1. We'll hosting Critical Role here at 7 p.m. Uh, and on Friday, uh, we got uh, Beamdog doing their thing. And then a fireside chat at 11 a.m. Uh, with Nathan. So keep, uh, keep an eye out for that one. Uh, I believe he will be giving away some fun stuff uh, as well as some, I don't know, he's always wanting to uh, give out some news that I don't necessarily say is okay. So he might be doing that too. Hard to say, really. Um, and then uh, Tales from Candlekeep will be doing their thing uh, at 12 noon. 1 p.m. we'll have uh, Roll20 Presents Tomb of Annihilation with Dungeon Master Adam Coble. And then the Dragon Friends are back in force 5 p.m. Uh, on uh, Pacific Time on uh, Friday as well. And Counter Roleplay is at 3 p.m. on Saturday. And that rounds out our schedule for this week. Um, lots of fun stuff happening. We got Kate Welch joining the team next week. A week from today will be her first day here. Uh, if you don't know, she is hired as a D and D designer, uh, and will be coming in, getting, we're going to be ramping up very fast, and doing lots of fun Dungeons and Dragons production there. But you may know her already uh, as a member of the Acquisitions Incorporated C team. She plays Rosie B Stinger, uh, and we'll be hosting that on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific time when we can. When we don't have any other thing else going on, but uh, we're, we're we're clearing the schedule as it were. Uh, thank you guys so much for subscribing uh, on Twitch. Uh, I saw that Danny Hartel did subscribe on Twitch, so good on you, Danny, uh, for subscribing to the channel that you're broadcasting from. Always fun. Uh, six months in a row. I think you have more than I do, so good on that. Um, and uh, Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms uh, has a fun event going on right now called Dead Winter, where you can unlock and gear up Regis. 
the wonderful halfling from Bob uh, Salvatore's series of Drist books. He's one of the companions. You can unlock him. He's pretty sweet uh, in the event that goes now through next Monday. Uh, Neverwinter Lost City of Omu, uh, if you guys are playing your MMO. A new module that has the entire Lost City of Omu, uh, not the entire, but a big, a big portion of it uh, is coming to PC on uh, February 27th, and it'll be out on PS4 and Xbox One uh, just a little bit later on. They've been really good about re- releasing those about three weeks later. Um, and uh, Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition is also coming out uh, from Beamdog. We spoke to Trent on Dragon Talk a little while ago. He is really excited about uh, what's going on with Neverwinter Nights, working with the community. Uh, that was a seminal game back in the early aughts, and uh, people still use it to this day. We just talked to uh, Hawk Robinson uh, from uh, RPG Research uh, last week, and he said that he has a module that he uses uh, for some of the... Um, uh, purposes of, uh, of 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 what he's teaching and going through for those things. So it is out there, and uh, all the modules that have been created will be compatible with the new Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition yeah. that's coming from Beamdog, which I think is is badass. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, some news coming on when that will actually be coming out very soon. Uh, so uh, I can't reveal that just yet, but it's 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 out there. It's being talked about. The release dates. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, all right, I think that's one of the things I want to get through right now uh, before we start this up proper. Thank you, Win the Fox, for subscribing. You're a good person. It means you have won the Fox. Is that? It's a, it's a W Y N N. Uh, so I guess not. Not. You know, whatever. Me making stupid jokes. Oh, oh, and then uh, uh, oh, no, never mind. We also have Merciful DM, who is going to be on as an interview later on today. In fact, so we'll be talking to uh, Lisa Chen and Alan Patrick from the D and D Adventurers League, kind of rounding out our inside the D and D Adventurers League series of interviews we've done with the uh, six admins. They've got some great stuff planned for uh, uh, the Adventurers League going forward, and uh, we'll be talking to Lisa and Alan about their work in the community and how much. They are approaching things like Facebook and other things uh, uh, to uh, kind of just really enliven what is going on in the ancillary parts of uh, the D&D Adventurous League. Good stuff there. Can't wait to talk to her. She's awesome. And uh, thank you for subscribing. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, all right. So I think that's enough of me prattling on, and we can get to our first topic of Lori Chanel. You guys ready for that? I think so. We'll do... Uh, a little bit of lore on the D and D cartoon, uh, and or Tiamat slash Venger, and all yep. the stuff that goes on there, and pals, and pals, and all their friends. Sounds good. All right. Well, I he- I heard the little clicks. That means we're recording. Thanks, Ryan. You good to go? Mm-hmm. All right. Let's do this. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Lore Master Mr. Matt Cernit. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. We are going to talk today in this little segment where we uh, uh, drop tidbits of Dungeons and Dragons lore for your own edification and perhaps use in your D&D campaigns and games. Uh, today we're going to talk about something that a lot of people started hearing about Dungeons and Dragons uh, from this thing, from the D&D cartoon, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the Saturday morning cartoon, in fact, uh, when that was a thing uh, in the 80s. It's pretty much the first thing I remember seeing that had Dungeons and Dragons on it when I was a kid. And uh, it has some some Dungeons and Dragons lore within it, and we wanted to kind of talk about all of that and what it all means. So do you know, when did, when did the D&D cartoons started to get uh, aired? Let's see, uh, 84, 85, no, 83, wow. Yeah, yeah. So 83, wow. Yeah. It had, I was five. <laughs> it, it had uh, three seasons, and um, they were pretty short seasons. Uh, so I think it only had a total of like 27 episodes plus one unaired episode. So the, Right. Do we have you seen the unaired episode? Well, you can't see the unaired. Well, you can't. Mm. So rewind. There's long been a rumor that uh, in the last episode of the series, all it's revealed that all the characters are actually dead and in hell. And wow, <laughs> it gets, yeah, pretty, I didn't know that. Pretty dark rumor. Yeah, uh, and uh, that is entirely untrue. Like the reasons why it wasn't aired or whatever studio reasons, but. Um, the one of the um, main uh, writers of the show, Michael Reeves, uh, a few years ago now, uh, released the script on his website right. in order to sort of quell these weird rumors about that that being the case. And uh, so you can actually kind of see it because I think somebody. Um, 
I don't remember what country they were in Spain somewhere somewhere anyways they uh, took that script and then um, basically made a comic book for it neat and then someone else basically made a radio play out of it and that's all up on YouTube somewhere and the the the, the episode finale or the season finale is called Requiem and that is when uh, Venger is redeemed, and the kids get to the choice of whether or not to uh, go home. So. Ah, okay, cool. Well, we started at the end, but let's yeah. let's let's get to the beginning. So, I mean, one of the most iconic things about uh, the D and D cartoon is that opening sequence where it's a Dungeons and Dragons ride. Yeah, they go through the ride, the roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. It somehow yeah. transports them into a fantasy yep. world, and they all have powers. Uh, g- given to the, uh, the, and they're mostly teenagers, you know, when they're going. Yeah, they're uh, like eight, going. 8 to 15, somewhere around that range, depending on who, which carrier you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but like, you know, uh, you, kids of the, of the day could identify with these characters and they all get uh, adventurers' uh, classes assigned to them. They're not necessarily all classes that existed in the game at the time. Well, so, yeah, they, they, there are classes that existed in um, around that time. So, uh, Cavalier is one of them. That's uh, Eric. He's the got the shield, um, and that's a, that's a class that was sort of a or a subclass. I forget now which term was used at the time. <laughs> not prestige, no, not <laughs> prestige class. That um, was used during sort of the first edition period, yeah. and uh, I think that was in Unearthed Arcana, but I could be wrong. Uh, and, uh, and then, the, you know, there's a ranger, there's a um, monk, uh, and a thief, and wizard, and then barbarian. So that's... that's and there's an acrobat as well. Acrobat, yes, not, not monk. Acrobat, yes. Yes. Interesting that they chose acrobat over, over monk. It was always an uh, odd yeah. thing to me, looking back. Yeah, but I at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, she's just badass, and then right. it makes total sense. Pole vaulting, cool. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so then uh, they're met by a character called the Dungeon Master. Yep. And so I, there's actually, uh, I have on my computer here the CBS notes on the series, and it's a page of notes from a meeting in uh, 1984. <laughs> Which and we're going to be f- perform for you live <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, and, and basically it, it outlines exactly how the show works. It talks about how essentially, you know, the, the show's supposed to be about the kids' quest on the way home. The Dungeon Master wants them to stop some force of evil during an episode. And the kids' altruistic desire to help someone besides themselves is what gets them involved in whatever that particular episode's plot is. Mm-hmm. And Venger is never meant to be the main villain of any plot, and it's never sort of meant to be like, and now we have to save the world from Venger because they wanted Venger and Tiamat to be sort of these recurrent uh, characters that could be used season over season, year over year with all these different stories. And so that's why the pattern of every show is basically like, hey, we have to go and help the cloud bears and oh, look, Venger's here. And, you know, I have to go help the dwarves. Oh, look, Venger's here. <laughs> you know, over and over and over again. So who who was the character of Venger? What did, what did he look like? So Venger was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he, was, he was voiced by uh, Peter Cullen, who also did Optimus Prime and many, many other characters. Um, fun tidbit, um, the person who uh, voiced the Dungeon Master, no, Tiamat, um, also voiced uh, Megatron in the... Yes, in uh, the original one, too. In Peter the, Walker. The, yes, in... I don't know if he was in the original whole original series, but it was in the, the movie. I'm not sure now. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, so Venger is this guy, and he's, he's tall. He's got bat wings. He rides around on a nightmare. He's got one giant horn... Why? Uh, he's got fangs. Who knows? R- red eyes. He's bad. He can cast magic. He does lots of zapping um, with his with his finger. Uh, and he's served by this thing called the Shadow Demon, which um, looks remarkably like the creatures that were called Shadow Demons at the time um, mm. that were in, I forget which, Fiendful or Monster Manual 2 or whatever. Um, and it that's sort of like his familiar that goes out and does things for him and finds things out and then he will show up and do bad things and then the kids defeat him or run away or whatever. And he has an antagonistic relationship with uh, the Dungeon Master in particular. And what he's trying to do basically in the whole series is get the magic weapons that the kids have for reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you know, the relationship that between the Dungeon Master and Venger and why that's the case and why they both can just sort of bop around in this world and so on is really unclear. And that's, that's again, something that, that was intentional. Like, they, there's a thing here that says in this uh, meeting notes, uh, you know, the precise order of the universe of the D&D realm, uh, the relative position of Dungeon Master and Venger, who's in charge of the realm, how did it come to being, where is it going, is never revealed. 
The stories hint that there's much more beneath the surface, but that's it, basically. Oh, okay. So, like, the, it was intentional yeah. that it would obscure uh, everyone's understanding of where this kind of fits. Right. And so Tiamat is this sort of um, – uh, she's sort of meant to be the most uh, powerful and terrible creature in the realm. And she is antagonist, of course, Venger, and pretty much everything else. And so uh, sometimes Tiamat will come up and show up and uh, ruin Venger's plans and stuff like that. Now, was this the first time that Tiamat had been shown in D&D lore? No. I mean, there's, there's certainly other, I mean, certainly any sort of cartoon version. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, Tiamat shows up earlier. Um, and, I mean, like... Let's see. I, I, I hesitate to say that there's any particular use of Tiamat that's very strong before this. I mean, there's sort of the idea of uh, Takesis kind of being like Tiamat um, in Dragonlance. But but 1983, yeah, Dragonlance uh, didn't exist. Yeah. And, right? And so the t- it might be the, like the, the first sort of real strong use of Tiamat, yeah, in anything. Because I can't think of any adventure before then uses her. Okay. But I'm not... Not positive. All right, and then and then Tiamat ends up being, uh, uh, you know, as, as you said, you know, introduced and in being like a through line. But was it you? Was was that character or that goddess uh, used in D and D lore after that? Oh, um, well, I mean, obviously, plenty recently with uh, the the uh, adventures that we had where um, the dragons were. Um, trying to take over and so on with in the Forgotten Realms. On. Right, but I'm trying. Was, was Tiamat always a part of the Forgotten Realms, or was it? It was it. E, well, it yes. Um, so uh, when, t- when did that get added? Yeah, uh, Tiamat is a god of the Forgotten Realms, and, and definitely throughout the whole Second Edition period. And there's sort of some interesting stuff there where um, she has kind of like a servant dragon who is in charge of Chacenta for a while and masquerading as a human being and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot of, uh, um, sort of subtle references to Tiamat throughout the whole second edition period where she kind of has servitor dragons doing stuff. She isn't necessarily like charging out into the world and doing a whole bunch of different things because she's, you know, a goddess level right. sort of threat. Right, right. Okay, uh, so but like, from what you're saying, it sounds like this might be the first major incarnation of Tiamat in in any kind of D and D lore, and then uh, uh, it was used throughout after that. Yeah, and what's interesting too is is that Tiamat shows up, I think, in the toy line, um, along with some of the other characters who appear in the cartoon, which is uh, Strongheart, Kellick, and uh, I'm going to blank Warduke. Um, but those characters appear in the toy line, but it, the toy line for the United States didn't include Bobby and Sheila and Venger and so on and so forth, uh, oddly. It didn't include the main characters. It right. included the secondary characters. And I think it had something to do with the way that the, the products were just licensed very differently. I think there were some toys that were made, like, in Portugal that were the main characters from the cartoon, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, in other places like that. But, um, but in sort of just the way that things were licensed out of different parties, it, I think they, they had a, a difficult time sort of managing that process. So you see a lot of, um, you know, a merchandise with uh, Strongheart and Warduke, like uh, party plates and stuff like that. Yeah. But you don't see a lot of stuff like that with the main characters from the cartoon. Which seems like a mess. Yeah. <laughs> Looking um, back, but now it, you're like... There were some, like, uh, um, choose-your-own-adventure style books. Uh, there were some sticker books, uh, things like that. But, yeah, it, it was sort of this weird thing where th- the ownership of those characters and who owned which ones was kind of parceled out in different ways to different people. Got it. Okay, so so back to Venger. Who is yeah. who is the real topic of, of all this that kind of started us going here? Uh, what 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 is it? Why so he captivated you? Yeah. Why why was that? Um, I think it's it's just a really I- iconic character with weird one horn, and then he's just this um, sort of mean villain. And clearly, they clearly have that subtext relationship, uh, Venger and the Dungeon Master, throughout the whole series. And it's kind of like, what's going on here? What's going on here? And that actually is answered um, in the last episode script where. Um, it, the Dungeon Master refers to uh, Venger as his son after he is uh, sort of um, uh, whatever uh, reborn as a, sort of a good character when he sort of gets affected by this weird magic. Mm. And uh, so th- that's really interesting because obviously the Dungeon Master is this tiny little guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Venger is like a human character even when he's sort of transformed. Uh, Venger also has a twin sister, uh, Karina, I think her name is, 
and she's uh, also super evil and dresses like him but doesn't have a horn. So presumably the dungeon master at some point had children with somebody. They were corrupted by some sort of super evil. That's the implication of the, the series and so on. And mm-hmm. then uh, the dungeon master is, I, I mean, the, the, the implication of the last episode is that the, the whole thing has been the dungeon master trying to get the kids to come somehow redeem uh, Avenger throughout this series. And now that they've done it, he's like, okay, you can go home or you can stay here and help me clean up these other messes I have. Mm. And, uh, you know, by the end of the episode, I don't think they have actually decided that it's kind of just where it ends. Right, yeah. right. Cliffhanger so, style. So the writers of the TV show knew there, were, there was impending doom for the end of their show and were like, yeah. let's just let's get this cleared up and then <laughs> maybe we'll go back, yeah, but well, probably not. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, yeah. right. Again. And then they didn't the get the last episode like made, so. Yeah. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, how, how, what other ways has uh, the lore from that cartoon uh, made its way into kind of our current, uh, you know, idea of lore? Is, is it in a Greyhawk type setting so, at so the time? Like what, what, yeah. Yeah, the the world that's sort of described in, in the, um, the, the show doesn't really match any particular um, world of the, of D&D. Um, there's... Uh, references to to various things that are common in D anD D throughout, but like you know, Forgotten Realms references Greyhawk stuff all the time, and vice versa. Uh, so um, the the characters, because of that weird, not really understanding where the ownership of those characters lie. Like the after the cartoon ends, they they lay fallow for a long time, and then they get picked up in little pieces here and there. So for example, in the um, Baldur's Gate 2 uh, game, there's some place in Athcatla or something like that where there's portraits on the wall and I think it's Bobby and one of the other characters are mm. portraits on the wall. Uh, there was a comic book produced by TSR that was like the TSR Worlds comic book and it was sort of like this um, thing where uh, the the mage character, wizard's character's name is escaping me at the moment. Um, Presto, uh, someone who looks very much like Presto and is a sort of bumbling wizard, is uh, taken along a tour of various fr- worlds of the the um, fr- fr- or D and D of the by, multi- of the multiverse. Yeah, by Elminster and so on, and so he oh, you kind of get to meet various characters from various worlds, and you know, and he com- sort of comes along, and, and there's a, the hint of them at the end. Um, there's uh, there's a scene in, I think it's Gem, like the cartoon Gem. Really? Yeah. Where they show up in a crowd scene with slightly different colors because oh. the same company was illustrating both things and they, they just <laughs> put them in. It was, but it's, it's clear that the character is just in slightly different colors. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah. They got they got palette swapped. Yeah. And uh, then the when the um, first DVD set came out for um, the cartoon – there was like a special edition version that was done uh, in like a little um, sort of red box, like in the red box for um, you know the D and D game. Mm-hmm. And in that, there was a little booklet that w- had an adventure and the statistics for the characters and the NPCs and you know Avenger and so on and so forth. Uh, and I got to write that. So oh, nice. <laughs> Avenger's probably a little too powerful. <laughs> You gave them all the all the stats. <laughs> yeah, not canon. <laughs> um, but uh, that that sort of reveals there that idea of um, Avenger being uh, the son of the dungeon master and stuff like that as well. Uh, that that edition of the DVD set as well included a uh, fan made movie called Choices, where it's the the characters as uh, slightly more adult characters. Um, they're like maybe in their twenties or something like that. And they're still stuck in this. They never left. <laughs> they never left. And it's all about how, like, you know, they you know, they just want to get home. And there's this really sort of emotional moment where Hank is considering killing this orc that he knocks down because he's, he's like, maybe we just have to get back by killing everything. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Yeah, it's pretty dark. But it's really good. It's it's still on YouTube someplace. Um, and the the guy who made that also made sort of like a trailer for a D&D fan film with a lot of the same actors that I don't think ever got made. 
Um, but that's on YouTube. So if you look for like D and D uh, and then choices, I think you'll probably pick it up on YouTube. That's but, super cool. Yeah, yeah. I love the idea of you know ten years later, twenty years later, going back and seeing yeah, you know where these characters are, how they ended up, how being trapped, you know, Bobby being trapped at at eight years old. Uh, you know, suddenly being a 28-year-old uh, dude and be like, this is all I am. <laughs> we, we, we've often kicked around in the office the idea of, of a, like, cartoon reboot if we could get someone to do it. And that would be, uh, well, it's been Chris Perkins' idea, basically, which is that, um, you know, they all get back to the world, but Venger comes with them. And so Venger and Hank are stuck in an apartment, like living together. Just <laughs> <laughs> it goes the opposite, yeah, where they're like they're just these crabby all the time, and Venger doesn't do the dishes. And, yeah. yeah, and then Ward Duke like delivers their pizza. <laughs> He's like, "Hey guys, what's up? Yeah, I still got the same helmet on." Yeah, <laughs> I I think that'd be awesome. I would I would watch that. I would like that too. Uh, very interesting. So uh, so yeah. So basically, the lore of the of of the cartoon is in its own little space yeah it's kind of its own its own pocket dimension um i'm obviously it's it's a small space so you could throw it pretty much anywhere you wanted to if you want um and the you know front realms has, has plenty of room so <laughs> if right. you feel like it you can put it wasn't it called the realm where they were wasn't yeah it called, like so was it was there I, for some reason my brain always connected that with the forgotten realms but the, i don't think there's other than the the elminster um comic book and the pictures in F. Catla and so maybe you know what never mind it, it just did it's a forgotten realm somewhere <laughs> it's, 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 it's a part of the realms yep, yep, it is a realm I want cloud bearers for my D&D game so yes <laughs> what were cloud bearers so there was an episode that um, where they have to go and like uh, help out the cloud bearers I forget why I, there might have been fairy dragons involved um, but the they're clearly just sort of like care bear slash Ewok slash gummy bear, like which were all <laughs> very popular <laughs> yes, in 1984. Yes, like all those sort of combined in one place, and and put into an episode. So I, unless I'm imagining, unless I'm remembering a He-Man episode, which no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not remember that being in the uh, D and D cartoon. So maybe, maybe. You never know. Uh, I, I, uh, now I gotta I mean, check. Now we have often talked how. Uh, oh, I'm right. They are there. Okay. The gummy bears uh, are a pretty awesome fantasy uh, property that is uh, ripe for exploration. Yes. Too. Yes. I would write that in a heartbeat. I like that. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go drink some gummy berry juice and uh, uh, hop off of this uh, topic. All right. Bouncing here and there and right. everywhere. Uh, where can people get in touch with you to uh, to uh, proclaim their love of Avenger with you? Uh, I am on Twitter at, at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Awesome. And uh, we're, we're welcome to any and all fan art Avenger that you have. There's uh, a lot of fan art for, for the D&D cartoon already out there, and it's a lot of it's awesome. There's some really good stuff out there. Sweet. So uh, uh, go check it out if you haven't checked it out, and then uh, let's share some more. Throw yeah. it up on our, our Twitter feeds. We'll, we'll retweet it. It's more good cosplay. Stuff. More cosplay as Venger, please. I just want that. Yeah. You know, the weird, the weird uh, outfit he's got is, is amazing. Yep. Thank you guys uh, so much. We'll be back next week with some lore you should know when you get a chance to listen to it. The hell was that, cat? <laughs> I liked it. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. I just like having a conversation with, <laughs> with the listeners. We'll be back next week or whenever you get a chance, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. Uh, thank you to whoever mentioned that it was in the realm here on chat. I just glanced down and saw that. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was called the realm. Uh, thanks in advance. Uh, all of these deleted messages are making it hard for me to find it, but thank you for it. Uh, yeah, but not thank you for the deleted messages, whoever that is. Zillion guy who's spamming in there. Uh, all right. So that was the first topic of the day. Uh, maybe we should have done the other one first because it's uh, a lot more about like what, how we approach all this canon stuff. So yeah, we'll get to it. that right about now. Um, cool. You ready? You ready, Ryan? Almost. Almost. There was vamping for such a long time. Welcome to another edition of Lore You Should Know. My name is Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Mr. Matt Cernet. Howdy. Lore Master Extraordinaire, and he came up with this topic uh, for this segment in which we talk about D&D lore. Uh, basically, like one that we haven't done before, and I think it's super important, is how uh, Matt and the rest of the Dungeons & Dragons team approach 
what is canon, what is quote unquote canon, and what is uh, uh, not, I guess, yep. uh, in in the lore and the story. There's with the wealth of uh, material that has been published, both by uh, you know people in this building and people without it. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what is the right storyline, especially with a game in which what you do at the table is the storyline that is mm-hmm. canon for your table. So we've often said head canon or, or you know, well, this is canon for my game. Uh, so how do we think about that uh, uh, officially? Well, uh, so it, it gets really complex, but it's also really easy. So uh, the complexity comes from the fact that, like, there's been – you know, s- several editions now, and even within an edition, um, any particular point of information might change. Uh, so, uh, in the past, there were editors and designers who would keep track of little bits of canon and try and make things consistent. Uh, but that was always a piecemeal effort, and so some people just wouldn't. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, novels wouldn't necessarily keep track of what uh, the, the game uh, design people were doing and vice versa. And so um, it's astonishing how well D&D can hold together, given that it was kind of uh, just by hook or by crook. It was loosey-goosey. Effort. Yep, the entire time. Um, so how we handle that now is basically um, whatever's best. <laughs> <laughs> who chooses? Who chooses? <laughs> so it's 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 an interesting process. So it, it depends upon what we're we're trying to sort of design or do with the game. Uh, when we want to say make a new monster for a new monster book, uh, there is th- a process where we have what we call white paper meetings, and that's where um, one person or perhaps sometimes a couple people on a team or something like that go and research monster X from various editions and try and find what are sort of the most common elements of that monster uh, that come up every edition and what is sort of the most cool thing and then get a general beat on whether or not that monster is something super threatening or not because uh, it's super it sometimes it changes a lot between editions sometimes something is you know CR 15 in in 4th edition but CR 4 in 3rd mm. um, and then in 2nd edition it's worth 10,000 XP you know and so we just have to kind of suss out where we think that lies in the the greater grand scheme of things and we have a discussion about that, and somebody writes up the, the white paper that sort of describes the design tenets for that particular creature, um, and we move forward. Uh, and that kind of, you know, sometimes that will uh, erase little bits of canon from the past because, you know, maybe the creature loses an ability that it had because in some edition, that in some adventure, that ability was critical, but we don't think it's critical overall for the overall arc feel of the the, the creature yeah, right? uh, throughout the editions um and so you know it can kind of uh um morph it, and change yeah morph and, and change and and really what we're trying to do is is find sort of like the best fit for the edition the best fit for the game overall and so on now when it comes to something like forgotten realms lore um you know hardly anyone's looking at it me so, <laughs> <laughs> so and and I'm but I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing the same process where I I go through and I I'll look back at the various editions of the game and say, okay, here's what's going on in this place, in this aden- adventure, in this adventure, in this is accessory, in this accessory. These are kind of the points that we really should lean on, and draw forward. And oh, by the way, there's been a hundred year gap of time where we don't really know what happened. So, if we want to change something, does it make sense to change it? You know, or not, and mm. it's really about um, sort of keeping the uh, the spirit of pl- the place um, sort of correct for what it was, and then also highlighting the the really interesting stuff that may have been buried under a whole bunch of other things in uh, whatever was going on in that product. Got it. So, so what do you do in that process if uh, something is like contradictory, like something that is completely different from uh, uh, establish things and, and, you know, how, how do you suss out what makes the most sense then? Well, I try to put it f- that in front of anyone who's doing that design. So, for example, um, you know, I can say to, uh, say Mike's designing a, a subclass that's had a lot of history throughout the editions. You know, I might say, hey, Mike, here's all of the things that are similar about the subclass. This design that you've done looks really awesome. Uh, but this element that you've made that's entirely new kind of violates the tone of all these other things that have happened before. Can mm. we tweak it to be this? 
Um, and if it's something that's just a straight contradiction, you just have to sort of pick what seems best for <laughs> current needs in the current game. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, like, uh, the power level of um, things in games would creep because uh, the previous editions often assumed, like, a literal creep in time for the Forgotten Realms, for example. Yeah. So uh, if you had an adventure that was released in 1983 for the Grand Realms or something like that, um, 87, let's say, and then an adventure that was released in 1989, that adventure in 1989 assumed that the adventure in 1983 happened Mm. and that there was some result there. The same was true of novels and accessory products and so on. So there was this gradual creep. And so you can actually, if you look at um, sort of character descriptions, say, you know, like here's some stats for Dritz in this particular product. Uh, His stats creep up product by product so that he becomes just tougher and tougher and tougher. Uh, you know, and that was supposed to show the, the passage of time that like oh these are just like player it characters. It was just sort of assumed that that was happening because oh he's gone on adventures and he must be more powerful. Ergo, his you know stats are like this. Well, yeah. at a certain point, Gritz has gone on so many adventures. <laughs> he's he's beyond the level cap at this point. Like, yeah, he's it's he's gone too far. Um, so you know it, like it doesn't make sense to do that. And then also. The the thing that it does that's really bad for the brand and bad for um, consumers is that if we assume that you that this is happening, then it kind of puts this pressure on the consumer to to buy every single product and to know every single thing that's in that product. And that's why I think, particularly in second and third edition, um, there was a feeling that places like the Forgotten Realms were just too big and too sprawling, had too much going on. And we're too hard to keep track of. Let me just have something simple like, you know, Greyhawk or something where there's only been, you know, a dozen or two dozen products, not just, you know, three dozen, four dozen, five dozen products. Mm. So one of the things that we made a choice to do in fifth edition was um, to stop or at least slow that creep. So the current year in Forgotten Realms is uh, 1495. <coughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Got some, something in your throat there? Yeah, uh, yeah. I just uh, you know, couldn't clear that out. Um, so... It, we, you know, when we have an adventure now that we release, you know, is out of the abyss before or after Tomb of the Annihilation? Well, if you're going by the actual release dates, then we know the answer to that. It's pretty obvious. Um, but, you know, we don't want to put pressure on the people who are buying the products to say, I see. you know, you have to play these in order. And if you don't, then bar, you know, and if you, did, if, you, if you have this adventure and you don't know what happened in that adventure, then, you know, you're totally screwed or anything like that. So we really want to um, just like stop or slow that down so that there's sort of an ever present now that these things take place in. Interesting. So that feels different from the way pretty much every other medium produces, you know, lore content, right? You know, I mean, you know, the, well, back when the expanded universe was a thing, you could go back into Star Wars and know what happened on one particular date and time and planet of what occurred. And, the universes of Dungeons and Dragons feel like there is a history and there's a, this happened and then this happened yeah. and this happened. So most fans want to have that kind of timeline. And, you know, if they want it in the Forgotten Realms, there's 30,000 years of that, right? <laughs> they can go as far back as they want to and as deep as they want to in the lore because there's so much material. Uh, and, you know, but as far as, like, the products we put out year by year... We don't really want to be adding a lot to that pile. Right. We want to. We want to make that just feel more organic and new every time. That makes sense. That makes sense for the current edition. But thinking about how you went in for stuff that was published, you know, say like 1995, you mentioned, you know, there was this idea that the adventures that were put out around that time, that there was an assumed conclusion, mm-hmm. and that so assumed conclusion usually was the heroes spoiled whatever plan or right. you know, or didn't depending on how it was written right uh but that's also assuming that when you know a player a year later t- picks up another adventure that in the world the, the events of that previous adventure had happened whether or not they played it or not right right and then being able to right and so what would hap- often happen with a lot of adventures and products is is that you'd get uh, sort of a preamble of one to twenty pages of history, uh, and in 
the early stages of Forgotten Realms, it was pretty simple uh, because they'd go to some place new, like uh, they they hadn't been to. Icewind Dale. So they go to Icewind Dale. Uh, that's a bad example because I didn't really go there. But <laughs> they Dale. were there already. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they'd have a section that says current clack. And that was sort of Ed's way of saying, okay, here's some news of the surrounding areas of the past year or whatever that, that has happened. And, th- and you'd sort of get an update uh, from some of those other areas that maybe the adventure doesn't take place in or that, that accessory doesn't really describe. And uh, and it sort of got the sense of this sort of ever changing now in in the world that really made it very engaging as someone who is consuming all of the material as I did you know if you're if you're really reading everything then it's fun it's like this living world that you're watching form bef- in front of you yeah you know but if you aren't buying everything then it was just this weird m- maze of stuff. Um, to the point where, you know, now things like, uh, you know, wikis and so on online are super unreliable because it really depends upon whatever um, author's uh, particular take was. You know, did, did they choose this path or that path? Did they look at this product or that product for whatever they're talking about? You whatever know, whether the canon it, yeah, for that what, thing is. If right. it's Tiamat or someplace Forgotten Realms or something about Greyhawk, like, you know, did they look at a fan site and take pull the material from there? You know, and so right, because there was a wealth of yeah. you know living Greyhawk stuff that was like yep. semi canon and yep. not canon at all, but like that was just what was assumed. And then right, if that becomes the the source, right, and that's where Wikipedia's can can kind of yep uh, uh, fall apart. Uh, but what about novels? You mentioned you know there are novels and there's a wealth of those. Those are a little bit more non changing in that once they're published, that that is the story that happens to those characters. Right. You know, so those have a little bit more permanency yes. than what you're describing. But, you know, there was a point at which, um, you know, TSR and Wizards at, at various points in the history were producing dozens to uh, hundreds of novels a year. And, and, and so, like, no one was on top of all of that. And so it was really r- down to whether or not an individual author would do their homework and, um, you know, whether the individual editor would do their homework and sort of research all this canon and stuff and, and so on and so forth. And in a period before uh, electronic files where you're actually going back through and, and thumbing through paper copies of everything, yeah. um, that was just extremely arduous. And so, uh, you know, you had to have an enormous base of knowledge in order to sort of write about the topic, or you had to do what many novelists chose to do, which was go someplace where no one's written anything <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and say, I'm going to plant my flag here right. because, you know, or one person's written one product about it. So I'm going to, you know, do my thing here. So you've got the setting, you've got the basis yeah. of stuff to jump off of, but yeah. you and felt a little bit more free to tell whatever story you right. wanted to. And that, that was one of uh, Ari Salvatore's reasons for going up all the way up into the Icewind Dale in the first place because right. that was someplace that he could describe all his own. And plenty of other authors followed suit um, in various parts of the, right. the world. Right. Yeah. No, if you hear him tell it, he was actually told to be like, oh, you can't do, you know, I think it was the, the Flaness or something like that. He was going to go somewhere else. And like, someone else has got that. And he's like, what about this? And you're like, all right, nobody's up there yet. So go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And you're right. And it does end up being, you know, what you can do. And that's honestly what a lot of dungeon masters might do too, is if Okay, there's this established canon of what happens in the Sword Coast and, and all these certain times. So let's go to somewhere that's outside of, of history, yeah. so to speak, so uh, you can make it feel like as living and breathing and, and, and natural as the rest of the world. And you might be able to have some hints of what's happening in Out of the Abyss or other things that are occurring. But whatever happens at that table is the canon. Yeah, and you know, it would be nice if we had a game where people didn't feel like they had to abandon the signature elements of <laughs> <laughs> world <laughs> so you know when we're making products right. now we, we we are we are cognizant of that and we try and make products where they're accessible for anyone who's playing now they don't need to buy anything else if you buy a tomb of annihilation you don't need to go back and buy the old chult book you know if you buy some adventure that we in the future that we set in silvery moon we're not doing that but if we did um you know you wouldn't have to go back and buy anything else you wouldn't yeah. have to go buy um you know sword Cross adventures guide or anything like that everything would be there for you to run your game right so what advice would you give to people who uh want to run in more of an established setting like this and uh and, and like you said want to, to be part of the world yeah. Uh, what, what advice would you give? I mean, really just lean in as far as you're comfortable, and, and it's your game, so it's, it's your canon. Uh, you know, the, 
if you want to go down every rabbit hole on a wiki and, and find your information that way, great. If you want to go to DM's Guild and download some of the old second edition modules or accessories and stuff like that and look at that stuff, great. Go for it. Um, you know, th there's, there's not really a wrong answer for your home game. Uh, if you're trying to produce something for DM's Guild and be abreast of current canon on everything, um, that's trickier. Uh, I, I mean, really there, that I think that's a place where, you know, it, it is kind of more fun to for consumers for you to flesh out someplace that hasn't been fleshed out before. So, you know, take a little town that's somewhere up on, you know, the, the North Way or whatever and, and um, make it your own and, and, you know, make an adventure there and do something like that. So Right. I guess, and I guess the, the hard part with that is, you know, you can always make everything your own. You know, obviously that's, that's totally... Uh, the option, but if someone wants to use, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the wealth of knowledge that's been produced by something that's out there, and you're like, well, I'm kind of winging it, you know, I'm making up half of it, but the, you know, half of it that I remember, I'm, I'm including in the game. Uh, but then, because so much material is out there and published in public, you might have a player who'd be like, you know, that's actually not true. Elminster does this, you know, and like, or I read Ed's yeah, latest book, yeah. and Ed's latest book says that you know, Laryl does this. And it's contradicting what the dungeon master is just kind of spitballing and right. doing yeah. with. I mean, that's that's basically the canon version of the rules lawyer. So, right. <laughs> just is there a canon <laughs> lo a canon lawyer? Oh yes, yeah. You know, and, and you, you, I mean, you just have to, to handle that the same way that you handle handle that sort of situation. A any sort of um, player who isn't playing along, right? I mean, it's a game; you're, you're there to have fun. So, so you'd say just it makes sense to to set the ground rules, kind of like you know, hey, we're gonna be doing it in this, but. Yep. What, what what's at the table goes, and yep. you know, you can, it's helpful to do it in a helpful way if you're going to bring in right. other material, right. but don't ruin anybody's fun. Essentially, I mean, if you're remi reminding the DM of a rule, like, hey, this is the rule because that's going to kill my character if you do it that way. Like that, maybe that seems like worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, it's worth getting out there. <laughs> but you know, if, if you're if you're reminding them of some corner case of canon just because I don't know why you'd do that. So, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think I think it goes into. I mean, this is one of the things that I never really grokked about Dungeons and Dragons uh, until I played it much more. It was like when I was a kid, I was reading all this lore and being like, "This is so. This is another world. It's a mm -hmm. way to transport your consciousness into something that has its own rules and things. And 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 you know, everybody's got to kill the next druid to get to the next level of druid. And I just thought that was fascinating, right? Like the idea that there's all things going in there. But then in actual play, none of those. No, no, no. Those not all of those things kind of coalesce. You know, mm -hmm. you don't always feel like every single detail is something that makes one hundred percent sense to every single player at the table. Right. And I think you, you know, there's a there's an adjustment. Well, there was for me anyway, like adjustment period to be like, all right, well, this is not the, you know, the 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 complete alternate reality of my dreams that I could jump into, but it has limitations and rules and you just, once, once you kind of get used to those limitations you can you can feel a little bit more free yeah and you know i mean as far as like um worlds that you can kind of dive into and um you know really get that sense of it is an, an alternate space like it is a different um place to enjoy like it, it's hard to think of anything that beats the forgotten realms i mean obviously the star wars expanded universe you you can just go infinite there but um y you know th there's been so many books and novels and, and so on and so forth for Forgotten Realms that it it it, it does give that sense of of a, a you know a world to explore with all that reading. Right, right, yeah. That's certainly why I love it. Yeah. That is why you love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you're always finding out new stuff in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like every day at work, I find something you know random and new. You know, I'm like and and sometimes you know it's. Uh, it's only like something weird, like that weird island out in the middle of that ocean in the middle of the continent that has some gnomes on it that keep on breaking a window, and that's the story behind that weird island. <laughs> why, why did somebody put that in the game? Why are the gnomes breaking the <laughs> island? <laughs> so there, the there, there's, there's, an, there's a, a, a cold ocean way in the north in the middle of the continent, and I forget the name of it, but it has an island right smack dab in the middle of it. And it's got a funky name. And it's like, oh, that's cool. What's that? And you go and you look in the lore, and there's a cathedral on there. And there's some gnomes that are breaking the windows because they don't like what the gnomes are doing there. And there's some other gnomes that keep on repairing the window because they do like And that's it. Like, that's all there is. <laughs> and it's, it's like, why? Why? Did someone put that in a, in a setting book? Yeah. Like, why, why, why did that? No, that doesn't. Ugh. Oh. 
That sounds so, amazing, though, at the same time, right? Like, it's so... <laughs> it is so bizarre, but yeah. Uh, but, you know, then there's, you know, there's other stuff like, uh, I don't know, let's say if there's anything re- recent at work that I can talk about. Um, <laughs> I don't. Really, I don't yeah. want to tax your uh, your deception skills too much. Well, but there will be little little elements of lore, um, you know, that I I pick up that, you know, basically help connect dots in current stories that we're making. You know, where where it's like, you know, we're struggling with how the plot goes in some adventure or something like that, and I'm like, oh, but wait, hey, that character that you're using that adventure uh, did this in this source product, and they had this item, and that item looks like something you could be, you could use, you know, and. Yeah. Voila, we have, you know, something happening. That, and then it harkens back to old lore and stuff like that as well. Right, so it, it does the thing of, of serving to, to further reinforce what's interesting and cool about the Forgotten Realms while also allowing, you know, the current designers to put their own tack on it. Right. Right. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And then think about it. I mean, every dungeon master at their table who's playing in the Forgotten Realms or one of our other, you know, kind of published settings is, like, doing that same thing every single time. They find the cool thing that they want to explore and get out there. Maybe it's an island of gnomes in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> now you need to follow and, find, and let us know what that crazy name is. And, A, then find out who wrote that now. I also want to be like, what is it? What's with the gnomes with the window? It's got to be something with Spelljammer. That's... It, <laughs> it always goes back to spell jammer, doesn't it? Yeah. We'll go back into the realm space. So it's super fascinating. I love uh, how we think about uh, uh, lore and just, you know, what it means and to each individual players and, and, and all that. And I'm glad that not all of the, the adventures that we published in 5th edition are sequential and, like, this is what's happening now, this is what's happening now. And I like the idea of, in fact, I've, I've heard of one player who is combining all of them to happen concurrently. Wow, crazy. Yes, right? They're like, <laughs> oh, the giants are doing this, and the demons are coming from underneath, and all the time the cult of the dragon is All right, is I'm doing out. I'm just going to go to, like, Arborea or something. I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the answer, right? Bail. Finally, we can get back to Mastika. <laughs> that's the only way. Yep. All right, awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, how can people get in touch with you and uh, ask you more direct questions about what lore is canon and what isn't? I'm on Twitter at at CERN, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Awesome. I hope you get inundated with questions now. You know, people ask me every now and then. I'm happy to field them. They're fun. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I am at Greg Tito, and you can ask me all those questions as well, and I'll forward them right on to Matt uh, for for all that fun stuff. And we'll be back uh, next week with another fun segment. So thank you very much for listening. If if you have time. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. That was super cool. Uh, I love all that. And Isle of Gnomes and all their ladders would feel weird. Their steps would make for, oh, it, would, it, was, it was like all the small ladders. They would be like miniature ladders. That's what someone is saying. Is alt true? Hmm. Spelljammer, someone says. Just for a reason. Spelljammer. Yep. Yep. It happens. Yep. It's a thing. Uh, do you have uh, five minutes? you want to answer some fun questions sure, for people? Yeah. Speaking of which, does anybody have any fun questions they want to ask uh, Mr. Matt Cernet? Uh, Fire as, up my computer in case I need it. As we are here. Uh, I'm looking. I thought there were some questions in here, but now I'm not seeing any. So fire away. Answering. A, oh, you, oh, yeah. So, uh, yes. Uh, 518 is an- answering questions right now. Ba-ba-bum. Red War. So do you know what the Red War? We were at, so, okay. Ian Kimmel, you asked on Twitter, and I actually don't know what the Red War is. Uh, so you need to tell me. And then maybe we can figure it out. Anybody know? Uh, so there is a, a, um, a quotation about Red War uh, associated with Cormier and uh, some of the organized play events take place near that area, but I don't, I don't know what's going on right now with uh, organized play. Right. It doesn't pass through my hands. Uh, here's, a, here's a pretty good one. What's your favorite territorial conflict in the Forgotten Realms? Hmm. Hmm. Well, so my my mind leaps to um, the whole Horde campaign with um, Yaman Kahan and so on. That's totally a ripoff of Genghis Khan coming in and doing stuff. I mean, they have the whole they build the Great Wall of China during this series of novels and so on and so forth. Um, and I I that one sticks in my brain mostly because I was in London as a kid uh, with my parents and I lost the Horde Lands book novel while I was on a subway train. Oh, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, actually, I think th- some of the stuff that's going on or has gone on in the past around um, the Dale Lands and Cormier and so on is actually really interesting. 
um, because Cormier is kind of put in the position of this. It's the good kingdom, you know, of, of good people. And, you know, we have good wizards and good knights. Uh, and it's sort of Arthurian legendy ish. Um, and then the Dale Lands is sort of like the, we're good rural people. We're like sort of Robin Hood. Mm. And these two forces have been in conflict over time in the history of the Forgotten Realms. And I think that that conflict's really interesting. Um, you know, putting basically Robin Hood versus King Arthur uh, is kind of a fun idea. And there's lots of other characters up there that, I mean, there's Zental Keep and, you know, um, the elves of the um, Mithranor and so on. Mm. That also make that whole area kind of an interesting place for conflict and story. That makes total sense. I like the idea of like lawful good versus chaotic good uh, fought out. Anyway, so we're stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. Uh, all right, guys. Well, we are. I mean, I, you got lots of. Okay, so you, I, I'm going to ask you one more question because I, I, you guys did a really good job and put uh, put questions in here. Uh, but then we are going to take a break and get to our interview uh, with Lisa. And Lisa promises to, to uh, talk about the Red War in in, in her uh, uh, interview. So we'll get to that for sure. Oh, good. Um, because it does have to do with what's going on with the D and D Adventures League right now. Uh, okay, so this is a good question. Sorry, what happened to Miss Dara? What happened to Miss Dara? Huh. So <laughs> it had some products that weren't so great. <laughs> it's the short version of that. That's, that's what the exhalation <laughs> was. It was like, how do I say this in such a way so as to... So, the, I mean, Mistara or the known world as it was known for, for quite a while um, had some really interesting products. Uh, the almanacs and um, there were some adventure products that were pretty cool. And... Uh, and then it leaned really hard into some of the sillier elements. Um, so Red Steel, a magical metal, um, that has the Red Steel campaign setting uh, kind of showed off a lot of that with, um, you know, this world where the, the setting itself isn't particularly silly. There's, there's this magical metal called Red Steel, and it kind of, like, uh, infects people, and um, there's lupins and tortles and... Uh, you know, Rakastas and um, and it's sort of swashbuckling and so on. But uh, you know, a lot of the art in the books didn't do it any favors. And then there was an audio CD that came with it that had voice actors doing um, you know, and they were they were very flamboyant in their depictions of you know various ethnicities of the world of red steel and stuff mm. like that so my, my red steel I'm magical metal is my bad terrible version of the the ridiculous sort of spanish accent that was adapted by the <laughs> actor who did that um and then the uh mistara monsters compendium 2 uh it, the art in that book is just some i mean uh, apologies to the artist but it's <laughs> the art director. So let's, 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 let's put <laughs> blame where it's due. It's it's not good. Yeah. Um. And and so it kind of it ended up kind of getting um painted as this sort of cartoony space, mm. and uh that was at a time when the TSR was in general um and the sort of trend in in sort of RPG culture was moving much more serious. So things like Dark Sun and Ravenloft and, um, you know, uh, Vampire the Masquerade and stuff like that was was sort of becoming more the norm of how people wanted to play. Yeah. And something that seemed silly and cartoonish just wasn't it. Just didn't play well. Yeah. The same thing happened sort of with Spelljammer where it just got sillier and sillier and it just wasn't something that people wanted. But Spelljammer, people yep. love, yep. and um, people do love Mistara too. There just seems to be less of a less yeah. of a percentage. Yeah, and it, and it really, I, I think it's it's just the a mistake of a a couple products really that, that kind of torpedoed the line. Mm. Um, but otherwise, there's lots of great stuff in Mistara. It's, it's great, it's a great setting. I didn't realize it was. Did you say it, there's the gnome? The known world. The n- known world. Yeah. Ah, okay. Was it a completely different setting? Didn't have anything to do with Forgotten Realms or? Um. So th- there's a weird crossover with uh, Greyhawk and so on because uh, was it Arneson? Who I'm gonna mess it up. Oh shoot. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But. Uh, did Blackmore. Is that yeah, you? Blackmore and so on. And so then that kind of got translated over into the known world, and the known world became its own thing. Oh, and I so see. they kind of got s- teased apart and became two separate worlds eventually. But it took a while to kind of get that rolling. Got it. 
All right. And there was the whole legal copyright thing that probably had something to do with that as well. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of the, the audio um, CD um, products that were done at the time um, were done for Mistar. Karamaikos, um, uh, there's a one with Knights, uh, Red Steel, and some of them are a lot of fun. Um, I particularly recommend the ones that aren't Mistar, which are uh, A Light in the Belfry, which is Ravenloft one, mm-hmm. and there's a Planescape one, which is um, the... It's the a Primer's Guided Outlands or something like that or a Prime I something like that. But it's it's a they're both really fun. Cool beans, awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Matt, and thank you guys. We're gonna take a quick break. Uh, we'll get Shelly in here and we'll call up Lisa and Alan for our interview with them. Uh, so thank you guys. Stick around. Uh, thanks to you, all of you who have subscribed. You won't watch the wonderful ads that we will have to be going right now. Uh, but uh, those of you who are just hanging out in here, uh, have fun with some some ads. Woohoo! Yay! Ad- advertisements, as they say in Mistara. All right, we'll be back in a Bye. second, guys. Bye. 